Hey, workshop students, I got this question by email. Somebody uh, was asking how you work these out. And these could be pretty challenging ones because of the calculus involved here. Let me uh, see if I can uh, work this out here. But it says, a metal bar with a length of L rotates around, around an axis located at one end of the bar. So here is this metal bar. And here is this rotating axis. Okay. And so we're going to rotate around the end of the bar. That's important. Keep in mind this, this harder stuff we're doing now with rotational motion often depends about what axis you're on. So, you know, you can't just say the torque is. You have to say the torque is blank as measured from this axis. Because if you change your axis, you change that, that lever arm R and you change your torque. So torque is relative to the axis. It's, it's kind of like saying the position of something is well relative to your origin. You can't just say the X is a distance of seven. It's seven from what is your zero? You know, where did you put your origin? Because one student could put the origin at one place and another student could put it at another place and the, you know, the distance is a different number. Now, we would all agree on the other things of the physical world, like where it's located, but on a grid, its number, its position would vary. And, and that's the same thing here, that its uh, torque or its angular momentum, or in this case, the moment of inertia, uh, sometimes referred to as the second moment of inertia because of the squared involved. Um, but it really depends on which axis. So it's real important here that when they say here, rotating about an axis at the end of the bar, we, we know what axis they're talking about because that would be different if we rotated it around its center point or different if we rotated it around the other end of it. Uh, depending if the how the mass is distributed. Now, something that is uniformly distributed, the left and right wouldn't matter, but this one is not that way. This one actually has a particular uh, equation. Um, and so, according to this equation, the mass is really small and increases linear. So, so maybe a, a, a picture might be something that looks like this because according to this equation, the uh, mass density here, see the mass per length is zero here, and that'd be like, you know, having no size to it. And then as you get further out, this piece out here, which is rotating around a much bigger circle, is quite a bit of mass, and because it's, it's far away. And then, of course, now you can probably see that if I'm rotating it around this axis, then as, you know, these points spin around, uh, it wouldn't have nearly as much inertia because the inertia has to do with the mass and how far is it located from your axis. So as a beginning step here, let me just emphasize a few conceptual things about the moment of inertia. Uh, mathematically, it says this that the moment of inertia is really a summation of each little piece. Um, and so we can think about taking our rod and dividing it into n pieces. Uh, let me grab a different color here. And so one mass would be right here. And so I would be saying, what is the mass of that little chunk? And then how far away is it squared? That's why rotating around this axis on the left would be a pretty big number because you would have most of your mass at this place where you have most of your distance. And so this part of it would contribute to the most of it. And over here, these beginning pieces, if you were adding them up from the origin out, they wouldn't you know, be uh, very big. So that's kind of the idea. Okay. So with that stated, uh, let me go ahead and uh, see what I can uh, work out here 
in terms of what it would come out to be. In fact, may I need to grab some lined paper here. Let me grab my yellow pad. Okay. So keeping this problem in mind, like maybe doing a, another step here, uh, what I'm going to do is imagining myself cutting this into a lot of little tiny pieces, uh, such that mathematically I might describe it like this. I'm going to take a summation from 1 to infinity because I'm going to chop it into so many pieces that uh, I get an infinite number, which of course means I am really taking the limit as each little chunk goes to zero. And so this M-I-R-I -I squared. And the reason I like to write it this way is this is the definition of an integral. An integral is a summation of an infinitely number of infinitesimally small pieces. And so the thing that becomes a d something, a dx, a dy, a dm, a dv, a d whatever, is then the size of the mass, not the position of it. Okay. Uh, I know, I know, I know. This is tough at first to, to get an understanding of because many students, especially beginning physics students, want to say, well, in my calculus class, I did a lot of this. I had some function f of x and then dx, and I had it solve the integral. And dx meant some infinitesimally small piece. So it actually meant add up a bunch of delta x's in the limit that delta x goes to zero. So you were going from a you know, infinite number, well, I guess one, to infinity. And so you're getting an infinite number of infinitesimally small pieces. So this is what your definition was. And because we used in the math class this dx so often, students then in a physics class want to say, well, there always has to be a dx here. And they want to just jump right on dx. But, but you got to remember that back in your calculus class, this x stood for a variable. It did not necessarily stand for the x-axis. And so it could be any variable. It could be a little tiny anything. And in this case, we're doing a problem where it's a little tiny bit of, of, of mass. And so that's kind of this important abstract idea in your math class. This was just a variable. It did not mean the x-axis. Uh, back when we did kinetic energy, that was a little bit of speed, dv. And we added up a bunch of speeds to get the kinetic energy. Um, when we were doing center of masses, we did do a dm here. And so you, you saw that in the last chapter. And I, so I think that's the only two times you've actually seen us go ahead and do an integral where it wasn't a dx. Um, but I'll just say it again, that in your math class, you learned how to do these integrals with the idea that x was some variable, whether that variable be velocity or whether it be mass or whether it be the x-axis or whether it be the y-axis. There was a lot of options for this variable, dx. So don't try to automatically force something to be a dx along the x-axis if it's not. It just needs to be a small variable. And so in this case, the small variable is the mass. That's what happens when you get it smaller and smaller. Now, likewise, let me say this, too. You're probably also going, well, wait a minute. Aren't you eventually going to take a integration where your limit is along the x-axis? So doesn't this have to be a dx? And I would say, okay, yes, eventually... I do have to then know what my limits are, which is going to be along the x-axis. So yes, I do need to switch this to a dx at some point. But that I keep emphasizing at some point because that's not what it would be right now. Uh, we have to give this some more thought here, okay? And so in order for me to solve this, I do need to switch to a dx. I totally agree with that. But I'm not switching to a dx because in my math class, I learned about a dx. My math class, I just learned it's some small variable. That's the dm. My next step is to say, can I switch variables? Can I 
do some kind of substitution? Do I know, is there a mathematical relationship between a little chunk of small mass and its size? And, and yes, there is. So that will allow me to do a mathematical uh, substitution where I will change my dm into a dx, and I will literally mean space. You know, I will actually mean the x-axis here, unlike in my math class, where I don't really mean the x-axis. I just mean a bunch of things I'm adding up. Now, again, granted, in your math class, you probably did do a lot of your dx meaning the x-axis, but that is not really what was meant in your math class. This dx was just a small something. All right. So keeping that in mind, I would call this step number one. All right. So I'm going to put here step number one and say there's, you know, three uh, different uh, steps here. And maybe I'll do a little more here to step number one because most people don't like the looks of the little differential on the front side. And so let me just change the order so it looks more like you've been doing in a math class where you kind of sandwich the function you're integrating between the integral symbol and the dx symbol or the infinitesimal symbol. I should call it the differential symbol. And then likewise, r is the distance away. And so as I focus on this problem and I call this out here the x-axis, the distance away is the value on the x-axis if we are going to put x equals to zero at this left end of the, of the rod. So I might as well then replace this r squared with the position x of where that little chunk of mass is. Okay. And so maybe that's a, a good, what I'll call, stopping point for step number one, and that is just to change an algebraic problem into an integral problem. Okay, so doing that, I now begin to ask this question. Well, maybe I shouldn't put an equal. Do I know any mathematical relationship? And we do. It's called density. Now, maybe I shouldn't use the symbol row, that's often saved for the mass per volume. When we do a mass per length, the traditional symbol is lambda, and that's what your author has right here. He's given you a little formula for lambda, okay? But lambda is a density that says, look, if you take a little bit of mass that is spread out over a little bit of length, okay, so coming back to my picture and looking at one of these slices here and coloring it in, I would say that little chunk has a mass of dm and it has a thickness of dx. And so if I wanted to know its density, I would take its little bit of mass and divide it by its little bit of, of length. And of course, what that means is there is a mathematical connection between a little bit of mass and its little bit of length. It depends on what its density is. And that can be useful in what I call step number two, which is to change then everything into x's. And so the dm becomes lambda dx. And then also, the lambda is given as a times x dx, which then means it becomes a x cubed dx. Okay. So now I can say, let's go to step three which is to finish this by saying, okay, I am going to add up all these chunks of masses. And coming back to my picture, so it says add up, add up, add up, add up, add up, add up, until I get to L. And so it would be zero to L of AX cubed DX. So the A is a constant in this problem, so we can bring it out. I hope they made that clear. Yeah, it says where X is the distance away. Um... OK, 
guess that could be a little clear. Linear dance density per length is given by this. And I got linear density, so it's a linear function. So I guess that indirectly implies A is a constant. But uh, it's definitely implying that A is a constant. So I'll pull it in front of the integral. And then I get the integral of x cubed is x to the fourth over 4 evaluated from 0 to L, which then becomes L to the fourth over 4 minus 0. And so we finish the math by saying it is A L to the fourth over 4. And so this last step, actually doing the math, is probably the easiest of it. And, of course, that's where this one comes into play. It says the correct answer is... And it says A L to the fourth over four. All right. Hope that helped. Bye now.